I now call this meeting of the Silver Falls School District Board of Directors to order. We will start with, oh, first I need a note of 10. All seven members are here, so we will start with the flag salute. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next up is the board superintendent operating agreement and Janet gets the honors this time. Yes, all right. This is the Silver Falls uh, School District Board superintendent operating agreement. On the issue of collaborative governance, members of the board and the superintendent will work together in good faith as a team in the best interests of students, modeling a willingness to learn together. Board members will recognize and respect the superintendent's responsibility to manage the school district and to direct employees in district and school matters. Board members will give careful consideration, listening to all perspectives, to all issues brought to the board by individuals and district leadership. The board may only make decisions at properly called meetings. Board members recognize that individual members have no authority to take individual action in policy or district and school administrative matters unless so authorized by board vote. Communication agreements. Board members must follow the chain of responsibility and communicate directly with the superintendent when a question arises or a concern or complaint is voiced by a staff member, student, parent, or community member. Board members will endeavor to communicate directly with the superintendent or board chair prior to meetings of the board to address questions and or concerns about agenda items. Board members and the superintendent recognize that good answers often require preparation in advance of board meetings. When a board member and or the superintendent has an individual concern, he or she must communicate one-on-one -on -one with any member of the board superintendent team as appropriate. In the interest of public transparency and full robust debate, board members will endeavor to actively engage in and contribute to board discussion and to share their perspective on topics before the board. Full participation from members in advance of a vote supports the board in making informed, well-considered decisions on important district matters. Thank you, Janet. Mm -hmm. Uh, next up is the agenda review, and I did remove the vote to appoint uh, budget committee members because we did not have enough time to review the applications. The applications are still on board book, um, and we can <coughs> discuss uh, the policy tonight if we need to, but we will not be taking action on that, so I wanted to mention that. Um, is there a motion regarding the agenda? I move to uh, approve the agenda as published. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the agenda as published. Tom? Aye. Jonathan? Yeah. Jennifer? Yes. Owen? Yes. Lori? Yes. Janet? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Thank you. All in favor? Next up is the consent agenda. Is there a motion? Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. We won't discuss. Let's vote. Tom? Aye. Jonathan? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Owen? Yes. Lori? Yes. Janet? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Thank you. All in favor. All right. Oh, there's Bryn and Maddie. I was looking for you guys. <laughs> Next up are our student representatives, Bryn Olvin and Maddie Rich. Good evening, I am Maddie Rich, and my ASB position is Junior Class Vice President. Hi, I am Bryn Olvin, and my ASB position is ASB Vice President. To get us started off on recent SHS events, on April 6th, our choir performed at a festival and did very well with our core layers and concert choir going to state. Also on April 6th, we had our unified alumni basketball game, which was well, very well attended by our community, and all of the players had a fantastic game. Skills USA had their state championship this weekend and were very successful. We are proud of the job our students did competing and especially proud of the way they represented Silverton. This is the only contest available for many of our skill-based classes and it allows us to measure our program against others while giving students the opportunity to meet other students with similar interests from around Oregon. Our state championships and national qualifiers were Rosie Barham in advertising and design, Olivia Rosborough in fi firefighting, Catherine Howe in photography, Rosie Barham in t-shirt design, 
Cordelia Bay and Jada, Jada Ridgeway in digital cinema, uh, Samantha Long, Bryn Kelsey, and Gabriel, Gra Gabriella Roth in um, crime scene investigation, Michaela Chase, Katherine Howe, and Kyla Welch in career pathway showcase arts and communications, um, Macy Carpenter, Carpenter, Kylie Detweiler, and Lindsay Gardner in career pathway showcase and health services, um, Simone Bush, Haley Meyer and Christi Christina Terhar in Career Pathway Showcase and Human Services. Um, and then tomorrow on April 11th, our SHS band will be hosting the Mid Willamette Valley Band Festival from 8.30 to 2.45. Um, eight schools from our league will be performing in the auditorium and Silverton has two bands performing tomorrow. The concert band performs at 8 a.m. and the wind ensemble performs at 12.45. You're invited to attend one or both. Admission is free. And then for more inter information, you can email Mr. Duffy. Um, and then on Thursday, April 13th, we are having a Best Fox Ever Bingo and Silent Auction Night, which is open to all community members. There will be ha handouts after the meeting if you are interested in attending. On Friday, April 21st, we have our Best Fox Ever Assembly, where our contestants will encourage school spirit and for our student and for our student body to attend the Best Fox Ever pageant. On Saturday, April 22nd, we have our Best Fox Ever pageant, which is open to the public, where our contestants will put on a show to wrap up m raising money for Medical Teams International and Silverton Area Community Aid. This year's contestants are Oscar Marks, Josie Lycom, Grace Traeger, Manny Salazar, Mateo Pardo, and Adeline Rich. On April 26th, it is National School Secretary Day, and May 1st is National Principal Day, and we can't wait to celebrate our staff. On April 26th, our sophomore class is volunteering at the Oregon Gardens, participating in cleaning up and planting the empty road from Main Street to the Visitor's Garden, as well as students working in individual gardens. Our boys golf team played in a tournament today hosted at Woodburn Golf Course, and our girls golf team played in a tournament hosted at Crescent Valley. On May 5th, the juniors on SHS prom committee are setting up for our prom at the Oregon Gardens. Our prom is on May 6th, hosted at the Oregon Gardens. Thank you, and go Foxes. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. All right, our school and principal report tonight is the Community Roots Charter School, and Kristen Kelly, principal, will be presenting. Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Kristen Kelly. I am the principal or the admin at Community Roots Charter School, and I was asked to present tonight, so here I am. Um, so we have about 95 students in grades K through eight this year, uh, we, and we have 13 staff members. Uh, oh, you can, I'm reading off yeah, the slide so that you can't see there. Yeah, I'll go check on that. Yeah. Um, so we, our education is a Montessori model, and we have uh, we embrace educating students with Montessori philosophy along with integration of the Common Core state standards. Uh, we have a strong commitment to social justice, ed educational equity, ongoing anti-bias and anti-racism work, and peace education. And we also have a huge, robust um, garden program that's led by Alyssa, who is phenomenal. So that's our mission statement there. And we're going to reset. <laughs> It's one of our students watering the <laughs> So um, I arrived at the school in, in 2020, and since 2019, we were working with National Center for Montessori in the Public Sector and Buffalo Cloud Consulting to understand our community's needs through parent surveys, student listening sessions, classroom assessments, and equity audits. And our leadership team mapped out a suite of priorities um, to work on the strategic plan. Um, but during COVID, things were paused to adapt to obviously the changing needs of our community and school. Um, the current board and leadership team have worked together to refine the existing plan into tangible priorities for the next two years. So we have three main buckets, thriving staff and students, uh, wise operations and engaged community. And you can see some crossover and cross pollination between those buckets. Um, a lot of them have to do with um, building a sustainable school and making sure that we're thriving 
long after, uh, for many, many years. Um, so some of the challenges and gr growth, uh, goals and growth that we face this year, um, due to a considerable decline in enrollment and therefore funding, because our funding is tied to our enrollment, as you know, post-COVID, um, we have a middle school and the the middle school level suffered a decline in enrollment over the past few years, um, but we also had to rehome the middle school to the Grange, so we have increased expenses attached to that program. Um, so the CRS board, admin, and leadership team needed to consider changes to our school structure that would decrease costs while still helping our school community to thrive. While the decision was difficult to make, it allows us to reinvest our resources back into our K-6 classrooms. Um, and aligns with our strategic priorities of creating a strong foundation for thriving students and staff, wise operations, and engaged community. Um, we hold sorrow over the reality of not having a seventh and eighth grade program because we know that we, uh, our program has built on the backs of great people who have come before us. But we also hold promise that our school is on the road to creating a sustainable school structure that ensures future generations will be able to access and engage in Montessori education. Um, and then the growth and the goals uh, more professional development for our staff. Uh, DER's assessment, which is in uh, developmental environment rating scale, which we do for all of our classrooms. Um, parent education, classroom observations, cross-pollination. Um, NCMPS is National Center for the Montessori and the Public Sector. Um, having, we use their curriculum to standards alignment and hopefully hiring a TOSA for additional reading and math support for our students. And we continue to work fabulously with our SPED team, which we are very grateful for. Some highlights and celebrations. Um, we had a visit from the Portland Opera. We're excited to have parent volunteers back in the classroom. Our student-led and organized community events include talent shows, trivia nights. Um, our students just got back from outdoor school, which is amazing. Uh, we have community outreach with Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. Um, Department of Fish and Wildlife come and they help uh, our garden program. Our students raise uh, Chinook salmon and rainbow trout and they release them into Silver Creek. So in a few years we'll have some fish returning hopefully to the creek. Um, and then we've received some lovely grants from Whole Foods Children for the garden program and Wise Mind Educational Services for, to bring SEL, social emotional learning and mindfulness practices to our students. Um, Shameless plug for our fundraising auction, which is happening next month. Um, so, but honestly, we could, our school wouldn't be here if it wasn't for our, our community raising funds because we're only funded to a fraction of the other schools. Um, so we're very excited about um, all these initiatives and we're very grateful for community involvement with families and staff. So you can uh, come join our auction if you like. It's fun, it's at the Witness You Tulip Festival. And lastly, I'd like to say thank you to everybody. Um, we really appreciate all the support from the school district um, and um, all of the teams that we work with. And we're just extremely grateful to have a home here in Silverton. Thank you. Thanks, Kristen. Thank, thank, thank you. All right, uh, so next up, we are going to have the Silver Falls Education Association um, come and present to us. I am going to read um, a statement because it's a unusual, we're, we're gonna, um, well, I'm just gonna read it. I don't need to explain it. Uh, okay, so it isn't customary for the board to have a back and forth dialogue during this part of the meeting. We have a meeting protocol that the board approves every July and we stick to it in order to have a predictable manner of conducting business. As chair, I've made a plan to deviate from our normal procedures in response to specific requests from teachers. During our special meeting, we discussed the district's final offer as published on the Employment Relations Board website. At that point, SFEA proposals were confidential. After that meeting, a teacher approached Janet and shared a desire to have a similar opportunity for the board to hear from and interact with SFEA. Likewise, we all received um, a similar written request from another teacher. So after consulting with others, we could see no downside to this except one. If during tonight's presentation there is a perception that the board didn't listen, that could cause further upset. Uh, that is the potential downside here. 
And still, I have planned for us to move forward with a dialogue and discussion after SFEA presents tonight. Uh, what we have the potential to gain is perspective. Even if the respective bargaining teams are not able to come to a resolution at the next session, we have an opportunity tonight to gain insight into the perspectives that come with being on one side of the table or the other. And what if potential understanding gain tonight helps us figure out a way to come to a resolution on the class size article? Um, Janet, sorry, I keep mentioning you tonight. Uh, Janet, who isn't on the bargaining team, but pays attention uh, to the progress reports we receive, suggested a proposal that includes teacher stipends in a format that acknowledges teachers working with extraordinary class size or makeup, and at the same time, acknowledges the district's need to have predictable costs and flexibility to find solutions using available resources in a given situation. It was an innovative attempt to offer a solution that works at meetings at needs for several, from several different angles. If we all pay attention tonight, maybe the idea for another insightful proposal will result. There are a lot of people in this room. Anyone here could come up with an idea to address class concerns as long as we are listening to the reasons why specific language in the proposals is or isn't acceptable. Given that, hope for a productive session tonight. I'm going to ask us all to consider our words carefully and ask ahead of time that you plan to explain how your verbal input connects to the language in the proposals. I also want us to keep in mind that when our meetings run past two hours, the quality of our thoughts suffer. Uh, this is another reason why I hope folks will carefully measure their words and keep them connected to language in the contract. Uh, finally, I was advised by le legal counsel today that we need to be mindful to avoid bargaining tonight. Again, if we adhere to discourse that focuses on why specific proposals are or are not acceptable, we can safeguard against unauthorized bargaining tonight. And if anyone comes up with an idea for a proposal that may offer a solution, please pass that idea on to Dan. Um, to be absolutely clear, um, I am allowing this back and forth dialogue between board members and the SFEA bargaining team only. This will not extend to public comment. Given that, SFEA bargaining team, are you ready to come forward? Sits in the front row. <laughs> Does he steal the chairs? That's good. There he is. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for inviting us here as a team tonight. Um, our last mediation session was dedicated to class size language, and we really appreciate the movement that was made by the district that day. It does not completely address our concerns and our students' needs. We especially appreciate the district's proposal to have this language apply to all districts in the school and not just Title I schools. We agree that a joint class size committee makes some sense, and it makes the process more collaborative. The district thinks we can accomplish this without specific class, class size targets to work from. However, it is our position that having objective targets will help guide our collaborative decision to provide the best support for the teacher and the students that we serve. Our goal is to provide teachers with more support in the classroom so that our students get the best learning environment. On all other open articles, we feel we'll be able to come to an agreement once we are able to find progress forward on our class size language. Hmm. And after that, we will entertain any questions you may have about. Um, I will, I don't, I'm, I'm failing here in preparation. I don't have a pen, but I would like us to, to take time to, um, give everybody a chance to speak before we take another turn. So just give me eye contact if you want to be the first. Thank you. Uh, just give me some eye contact. Yeah, there you go.
Well, uh, first of all, I want to say <clears throat> thank you to, um, to the SFEA bargaining team and all of our teachers who came tonight. I know it's a lot to ask to, in your busy schedule to come and have an open dialogue with the board, but I think we all can agree that it can be very productive tonight. So again, thank you and hats off to, to all of you for coming tonight. I really, really appreciate it. You know, over the last few mediation, mediation sessions um, and bargaining sessions, you know, I, I've had the, the pleasure of actually being a part of it with you all. Um, and at, we proposed two different options for Article 19 in the last session. Uh, the first added language that establishes yearly fluid class size targets um, and a full plan for remediation should class size exceed the stated targets. In fact, we actually pre presented to you um, the 2023-24 aspirational targets um, at the last session. Second option, second option we presented was option B, that went above and beyond class size alone and extended the process to not only include class size, but also makeup and workload. Would you be able to share your thoughts as to, as to what these two options are lacking in terms of addressing your concerns. Me? Mm -hmm. Oh, all right. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, so again, thank you for the opportunity to, to come speak to you. Um, we're happy to talk about any of this. Um, I think right now the what we really appreciate again is that uh, 30000 dollar pool that was an idea we floated a bit ago and happy to see that one uh, be proposed back to us uh, that's actually more than we were hoping for <laughs> so so that not opposed to that part I think the biggest issue right now for us is the the and, and you said it it was a fluid uh, class size targets we have concerns about the way that that might be um, developed and uh, especially if they're something like averages instead of looking at like individual classes and it might be helpful to think about this as like a uh, speed limit and so uh, I want to be really clear because what we've been proposing all along is targets and not caps I think that's been a pretty big uh, misunderstanding along along the way uh, so it might be helpful to think about it like a speed limit so it's not an absolute limit uh, a speed limit. It's something that we decide is going to be uh, safe for a given situation. And our targets are like that as well. Now, of course, there are uh, lots of vehicles that can happily and safely travel 90 all day long. There are also vehicles that are unsafe at any speed. Uh, we still, though, agree that a, a speed limit is a good idea. And if you're exceeding that, you're going to start having some conversations. That is what our proposals have been doing. It's like, so here's our target. It's not an absolute cap. If you're above that, we want to take the, these steps to address that. And uh, I also think it's important to, to note that the stipend is just about our last step. It's like, we want, of course, um, a, a process to go through. So. Uh, that might look like uh, shuffling kids into different classes within a building. That might look like additional aid time. That might look like another teacher. And if none of those are viable or anything, then yes, we do it arrive at a stipend there. And that's to recognize that that teacher is doing more work, and so they should be compensated appropriately for that additional work. It's also a recognition of the additional resources that teachers pour into their own classrooms. Uh, we did a poll with our, with our people and the numbers that uh, people are spending in their own classroom is, is, is it was shocking. It, I, yeah, yeah, it was over $50,000 just this year alone from our teachers pouring back into their classroom. So um, I think that's it. I mean, we did also like um, in the proposal from the district, you guys hear me okay? 
um, the committee. The public yeah, hearing. The, co the committee. <laughs> <laughs> that was proposed as a way of just making sure there's no um, bad feelings, that we've turned over every stone. Mm -hmm. And then that committee will decide, yes, they've done everything they can. This is just a situation that we have to grin and bear it. And that would trigger the stipend. We really appreciate that. So um, yes, again, like it's just honestly those numbers to send in the help it is not meant to be any other intention. Um, and when we've listened to discussions before, it does seem like caps and these trigger for help that that's being misunderstood. I'm gonna make okay. that clear. Do you want to talk about the next proposal or we'll talk, we talk about okay. Do we have any follow-ups, Lori? So uh, what you were explaining is that you wanted something procedurally in place um, to guarantee that there was a process followed when you kind of reached that point. Um, do you feel at this time that your principals are not in a position to offer um, those needs or do you think it's a I don't know do you think they need more support themselves I don't know it's okay if I take that one. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like um, being union president now is my second year that having clear contract language that everyone can look at teachers and principals in a really really chaotic time to be in education Yes. is kind to our administrators and kind to our educators. This article is not a rebuke against our administration. It is not a rebuke against our principals. Um, it is what our teachers are asking for to prevent resentment, bad feelings, and resolve real problems that do benefit teachers and help um, support our students in their classrooms with teachers that feel heard at least. Um, it's um, difficult sometimes when I get phone calls from panic teachers to support them. I don't know where to start. And with this article, it's a direct outpouring of some of that experience. Um, you know, have you followed this? Has this made sense? Send this just a committee to, re, uh, to look at. I think it mm -hmm. would be very beneficial to all parties in the district. Um, I don't think we responded to the other proposal, the class size with no, what was it, option B? Mm -hmm. With no um, with no numbers in it at all. But it applies, it, it uh, allows a teacher who has, we'll go back to Jonathan's comment, from the other, <laughs> a really hard class just based right. on some other needs that are in the classroom. Right. Is that, do you want me to respond yeah, to that one? Yeah, I can take that one again. And, and we appreciate that. Um, we had some real concerns around that one. It's again it's like the speed limit you know I mean having a clear set number uh, will trigger help uh, and that's not to say that uh, we believe principals will look at a class that is maybe smaller but has more challenges in it and just say well the contract says this we don't believe our principals will do that we think that those needs will still get there I think it's really helpful to have just a, cl a clear number that everyone um, administrators, teachers, community members, they know this is the goal. This is what we believe regarding the research, leads to the best outcomes for students, and it matters most to the younger grades because those are, that's an investment that pays through, uh, as, through to the high school and then beyond. You know, so. so, can I respond a little bit? Please. Can I say yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, we did have an all-member meeting and we showed um, both of the proposals to them and we had a really interesting comment um, from a counselor and a SPED teacher about um, option B and that is that the way it is written I understand where the heart comes from making education equitable is extremely difficult because every class is different their personalities are different their needs are different um, but in that case, um, our specialists felt like we're putting into contract language um, a process that would have us talk about students in an unflattering way. It's none of our intentions to come around a table and say, I deserve this because I have five IEPs or I have, you know, um, 
a kid that needs um, SLP push in and whatnot, and it made, um, it gave our teachers serious pause. We don't want to be put in a situation where we are racing for the language for support. It feels very subjective, and that made a lot of us um, a little uncomfortable. Because so I think what we're asking for the numbers is a very specific. Um, we're asking for help for a specific issue and don't want to open it up to comparing or being competition for whose class is the hardest. It's just not really where educators' hearts are at. That makes sense. Yeah. Anybody else? Want to yeah. I've got a question. Go ahead. So if, if your proposed contract language were adopted today in this school year, how many classrooms would have different support than you're getting today? Um, that's a really good question because when we ran this data in October, it was 12 rooms, but by this language, we would need to go back and see with each principal, you know, were these different supports added in? And I think a lot of times those things can um, um, and have been provided, can be provided and have been provided, I'm trying right. to say, okay? And, um, but right now, our solution is a complaint process, which we already have a complaint process. And honestly, a lot of our teachers, especially our elementary school teachers, um, they will complain, but they won't stand up against authority. If they get told no, they just kind of go back and do their jobs. Um, it's never ended up in front of you, that's just not their nature. And so I think in this case, um, uh, Jonathan, I don't have numbers that this, that this procedure would help because we haven't looked at each one of those issues. But I think like looking in the room, you can see that this is a major issue for the teachers and that um, they feel adamant that this would be a really great benefit to our contract. No, I, I sort of understand that, but as a follow-up, what would be different? I mean, I've asked, I've talked to some people, it sounds like people are broadly getting support from their principals. Like every student des deserves individual attention, I would think every classroom deserves individual attention. And mm -hmm. If they're not getting that, that's a, that's a secondary problem, but putting an arbitrary number in a contract doesn't solve that problem, right? So that's my, that's, so I'm trying to figure out what would be different in the classrooms on a day-to-day -day basis with your proposal compared to this proposal or any of the other proposals that are all advocating having conversations, which I would argue are probably the most effective form of problem solving. I can say, um, by having these numbers in there, it automatically triggers the conversation with the principal. Some, some teachers are hesitant to go to principals to ask for help, hesitant to say, especially if they're newer teachers, if they're right out of school, they're hesitant to go up and say, I need help with this, I have this huge class. They're more likely just to suck it up and deal with it. And that's not what we want to have happen because if they are getting the help, if this, if they go over the limit and they get the triggers immediately, they can say, okay, I, I and they can have that immediately triggers that conversation with their principal saying, okay, this would really help having an aid during this specific time for 30 minutes or for 20 minutes or for half an hour or for 45 minutes during these specific time periods where I really need the help, that would benefit me greatly. For them to have that initial conversation is huge. So, so you, you yeah. well, I think the point is that they're making is that they want um, a procedure mm -hmm. to yes. the principal to come to them instead mm -hmm. of the other way around. Is that, am I saying that correctly? Well, it, not necessarily. It, it empowers it them. It's just like, Because okay, it's a process that number. you. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and so here's this, I'm, I'm not complaining because it, it says I can It's a process I'm entitled to. Yes. yes. Yeah. And if everything's being taken care of how it should anyway, what does it hurt to have it in our contract? Because what you're, if I, if I may, well, let it, yeah, go ahead. What I'm understanding is that you want something in the contract that, that provides process, mm -hmm. provides definition without it becoming sort of that when you mentioned the complaint process, you don't want it to be adversarial. Yes. You want to yes. be able to mm -hmm. have, hey, this is happening. 
it's now time for this conversation, mm -hmm. as opposed to going about it as, a oh, you mean a complaint yeah. process? Right. Okay, I see what you're saying. So yeah. it just feels a little adversarial, or, or the approach in and of itself is a lot of teachers would just say, I'll just take it in. I'll yeah. just absorb it. And I that. don't think that's the intent. And right. uh, Jonathan, I, w I want to address a couple of things. I don't think it's an arbitrary number. We took the uh, some of this language from another district where it is being used and and used to good effect, uh, and they took the numbers uh, from the research of this is where education ha happens best at numbers at at or below here, and we we decided, you know, that's what we want. And I think the biggest difference between what we have now. And what we're proposing is the difference between a guarantee and a wink and a nod. Okay. You know, I want a written guarantee that this is the commitment we're going to make to our students because we believe that this is where education happens best instead of a, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do my best. Let's keep it off the books. That, that feels a little squishy to me. Well, I'm curious, you've mentioned the research a couple of times now. And, um, I'm wondering if you if you have that at hand. I mean, maybe not tonight, but and the reason I ask for that is because um, prior to negotiations, and you know, we're we're, ev we're trying to be very evidence based in our district. Of course. Um, and I've heard many times that there's no consensus as far as student achievement relative to class size. Now, it makes sense to me that there would be some some limit, right? Mm -hmm. But um, so um, that would be really helpful to me. If, if I could see that. We'd be happy to provide that. Yeah, yeah I would, um, the question is that, you know, after, after these conversations, you know, with the idea that, hey, I need some more resources, um, what, if there, what if the bucket's dry? What if there's no more resources to give? Then it, it you know, I'm afraid that it would be, if, if I need more help in my classroom for an hour, it's gonna come from Jonathan you know aid and I don't know how that that's where it's it's to me it's just it's tied to dollars if we're, we're already at three to four percent in a reserve fund that that to me is is where I, I feel like a process like this where it would happen and, and folks would you go we don't have any more staff to send in and it would just end with some hard feelings and I think that's kind of where but Tom the, go go our, our last Proposal A, because you're saying the B is not good, and I understand your reasoning. Yeah. But A has a limit on that that thirty thousand mm -hmm. dollar, and once it's gone, mm -hmm. it's gone. And so I think that satisfies mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. financial. If it goes to that, I mean, if the answer were additional staff, then that would be an additional expense. But yes. that doesn't buy much staff. I mean, I just you know, in the, in the you know, it, a teacher is. Total cost is like 110 a year. Um, if if yeah, I can, yeah. the proposal you uh, gave us was capped at thirty thousand yes. dollars. So to make that budgeting issue uh, easier, uh, there is no trigger to hire another teacher in our language. It's a, it's an option before. Uh, well, what you I want to hire it? No, that'd be great. Right, <laughs> We're always well, going to say I, great, but. I, the the thirty thousand dollars that's your that's your cap for the stipends yeah you know yeah and in in the proposal that that you guys gave us so it's it's option uh five basically yeah. out, of, out of four try it try this 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 and this and this i mean and we understand and we think it's reasonable if you can't get an, another teacher there another assistant you can't shuffle the classes then in recognition of the thing you know <laughs> We're sorry. Here's here's what we can do. We understand you're going to be yeah. spending more on your class. Uh, yeah. Here you go. I guess right. It's and my, yeah. And so I guess it's 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 my understanding that's that's kind of what's been happening already. But we have a difference of you know a different opinion there. Um, how have things been worked out in the? Um, have, have the this is these issues been brought forward in the um, uh, labor management groups that we started three or four years ago. With SFEA exec yeah. group, yeah, uh, we talk about uh, ratios, and uh -huh. um, I talk to Dan quite a lot, and we try to okay. solve uh, problems. And um, as I said before, part of this language is that when I have teachers call and they're upset and they need support, it's very hard to for me to figure out what steps have been taken 
sometimes people are just very emotional and they need um, like reassurance, but it's hard for me to go back through and see exactly what's done. So I think, again, this clear language would help resolve that. Have you done this, this, and this? There's a committee. It just makes contract sense. I, I just wanted to go back to your first comment. I think that the proposal A basically takes care of that. Like, like once it's gone, it's gone. Like, if we can't do A, B, C, or D, and there's no more money left, we don't, there's the, the, the process is just run out yes. of options. Yes. So, sure. and that's just a, there, mm -hmm. the acceptance of such a proposal would acknowledge that, I would assume. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the okay. only sticking point, just so long as I'm clear, is that these targets, rather than being outside of the contract, are in the contract. And then that, that's, a, in your mind, a substantive difference. In our mind, the targets have to be there to be an objective point at which the teacher starts receiving attention. Um, and these were shown to you during negotiation, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And if they were published on a website during a certain time, that wouldn't be good enough? Well, our feeling about that was these are not class caps. Mm -hmm. It's a point at which our teachers are going to be able to access this process. Um, those numbers are set by the district, and so they can fluctuate. And if they're not class caps, and we're just looking at help, and the cost is controlled, um, I don't see a reason to tie the language to those kinds of fluctuations. But we did offer in bargaining if that makes the district nervous, um, uh, because what we're talking about, I guess a reduction in force maybe, or something, there were some what ifs um, that we would propose on a committee. We could do that in, in comms. Maybe we go through another pandemic. And, you know, <laughs> and we, Please, sorry. No. And, um, you know, we need to re examine, you know, like an extraordinary situation, but, um, but um, that was our thinking behind that. But it's like, I think, I th okay, so I'm gonna play the other side at this point. So I can understand the need to have fluid targets based on a whole host of variables. And so I can understand the need to evaluate, like, like do we, you know, there's construction going on, we don't have this many classrooms, we're not, this is not reasonable, we cannot do that this year. Um, budget cuts, the pro uh, mm -hmm. proposed RIF, right? Like, or not proposed, but just like that could be on the horizon. I can think of a whole host of reasons why the fluidity would be important to administration. Um, and I guess I just wonder why having that yearly, tar I mean, y you don't like it because admin sets it no I think we don't like it because no I don't I, I think it's we don't like it because it's it's it fluctuates it can be whatever you guys decide it could be and it can change at a moment's notice I mean I you can change and, it to whatever yeah. and I guess that's the perspective that I want to bring across for, is, is that there are different there are a whole bunch of variables yeah, right that need to be considered and so that I want to honor that idea as well yeah and by having that fluctuation we could you could change it to a high number and and then those those um aids and stuff would not trigger they would not happen for those teachers that are they would be taking the brunt of having those large cl class loads I, I i have something along those lines too if that's okay go ahead i'm i'm i'm, I'm kind of my next question was was along your lines jennifer um y you know i appreciate you you know bringing forth you know targets and language that was in other districts uh, as helpful. However, I think we have a very unique district, probably one of the more, if not the most unique district in the state in terms of our geography, in terms of our school makeup. Um, we are not cookie cutter. Um, so again, I'm gonna play a little bit of a, of, a, of a point counterpoint here. I see these numbers as very cookie cutter. That in, may apply better into districts that have very homogenous school populations, whereas we don't. Um, 
So I look at the fluid numbers or the establishing yearly of numbers and tar uh, targets, being able to adapt not only to our geographic makeup, but also our budgetary constraints, our, our fluctuations in enrollment at each building. And again, we still have not covered, recovered yet from the pandemic. We're still down 240 students from, from where we were before, which again ties into funding. Um, so I, I guess I'm, I kind of along the lines of Jennifer, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand that, you know, if this needs, we may need to be fluid in a way because of our unique nature of our district to be able to adapt to the needs of all of our students and our buildings and our classrooms and our teachers. Um, so that, that was kind of wh where I was thinking. And again, I'd love to hear input on that. Um, the, the other thing too, and I'm not, I'm not putting this out there as, as any type of, you know, this is what we're proposing in any way. Of course, that's not what we're here for tonight. But, but you know, maybe this could be a collaborative process to start to set these targets each year, right? Maybe that could be the, a key where, where it wouldn't just be potentially admin setting these targets each year, but it would be co a collaborative process by which, you know, our, 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 our union representation could, could work on that along with little bit of bargaining. I, I wasn't trying to do that. I know. I'm just I'm I mean, trying to. The solution was say, hey, if we had something yeah. to bring forth to Dan, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to really I'm make it. I'm taking in all the ideas, but yeah, let's so try, not, not trying to do that. try not to get too close to that line. Not trying to go that line. So anyway, my apologies. That was not my intent. My, I think sure. you know my heart here is trying to help. Yeah. So, so Aaron, uh, we, we understand we're in a unique district because we teach and we teach here and our union is very it's difficult to represent everyone's views. Believe me, bargaining in this district is really complex and nothing we're asking for erodes our unique situation or our K-8 or our school choice. We have members in every building of this district. I just, I guess I philosophically don't understand why you would want to raise numbers in which teachers qualify for a process to be heard. The cost is moot. That has been capped, and we've already said that that is extremely agreeable. There is a committee to look at the process. We think that's a great idea, because I think you're addressing some of the concerns that, uh, that admin had that I didn't really understand. But now, in that same way, we are asking you to understand us that we don't see a, a rise in enrollment as negating the need for a teacher to have a process just to say, hey, it's getting a little tight in here. This is what I would like to talk about. The teacher has the option, so if they're in a school and they don't feel like this is a problem, they don't start the language. So it would only be teachers that were feeling stressed out. It would be teachers that are feeling unheard for a variety of reasons. And I think it would be the best way to solve a really difficult problem with some easy language. If I may. Uh, yeah, I think I, I understand your concern, especially around our K-8s. It's where I've spent most of my career. Love them. I absolutely <laughs> love them. And um, at the same time, I've, I've taught in town too. Love that as well. I don't think we're trying to get rid of any of it. The, the problem with having it so fluid, and I get that, um, just for example, at Silvercrest, when you have a, a large class happen to move through, it's like a cartoon garden hose, you know, it just kind of whoop, it does a yeah, lump all the way through. Um, and uh, what this does, and that's why we haven't proposed a cap the whole time along, it's been a trigger for additional help. It is a target. Um, so that, that's, that's the goal there, and and I think that the concern about like, well, what if a bunch of kids move into the district and everything? I mean, that'd be great. Those kids come with funding. It solves. It's a self-solving problem. Yeah. Well, I guess um, I want to offer a different perspective, and and I don't know if it's the correct way to look at it, but. Allison, you said that the problem of the funding is already taken care of, and that is true for the stipends mm -hmm. but a b c and d all require financial commitments mm -hmm. so an aid uh, scheduling alternatives uh, transfer or reassignment of students is not money but that's that's kids and families maybe having to move from mark twain to silver crest 
um, and that's significant. And then release time is also an open-ended financial question. So I guess I wanted to say that it's not, in my, from my perspective, that the $30,000 stipend isn't the be-all and end-all. Um, that's why there's possible in there. So the principal has control. We told Dan and Aaron in bargaining that we, they can have control of this like the remedy like the teacher does not want to be the administrator i don't want to be the administrator i want a place for everyone to look possible is in there we've talked about that as well we offered in mediation not this last time time before to give principal total reign but when we're done we need to be able to reflect on the process and then absolutely it wouldn't cost more than thirty thousand because that's the pool mm -hmm. wouldn't the uh Maybe I'm mistaken here, but doesn't the language ultimately give the teacher the final determination as to whether the process was satisfactory or not? That was a previous... No, no because no. you so proposed a committee, two administrators and two teachers, mm -hmm. to be able to decide if the remedy had been given or if there was like anything else that could have been done. Yeah, that's, that's in this. Is that in your last one as well? That was what I was... Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that's solved. <clears throat> I have another, a separate related thought on the, so, so I want to piggyback on the, the K-8, right? You talked about another district. You mentioned another district has this language. How many K-8s are in that district? None. None? No. I mean, in the state of Oregon, there's hardly any, honestly, right? So we are very unique. And one of my biggest fears is that language like this begins to be a perceived tax or or problem on a k-8 which cannot in its own nature fundamentally manage class i mean the variability rate is higher the smaller the building or the, and the more different grades are in a building it's just math right absolutely and so when when you have that high rate of variability you're going to have by the very nature Higher, higher highs and lower lows. They're just going to go through the, the, mm -hmm. the hose, right? Mm -hmm. And you're going to have the, the class go through. You know, we've had 30 years of chatter about shutting down the K-8s at least, right? Ever since consolidation. And once you have a something that sort of is seen as, as a challenge, an extra cost, an extra challenge, that I think we've been managing pretty well at our case, generally speaking, in the past. That's why I keep going back to how many problems are we solving with this. Once that perceived problem is there, you, you create strange incentives, right? I could foresee a principal looking at that saying, well, I'm not gonna be able to solve this problem. This one, well, we'll just, that transfer student from, you know, Robert Frost is gonna have to go back to Robert Frost, or we're gonna have a, uh, uh, well, let's create a creative blend because second grade's pretty big and, you know, I, I'm going to try to stay under this, this cap. So we'll, we'll create a first grade with five second graders and a second grade, right? I mean, you know, creating these sort of strange blends because they're trying to meet these targets. If there's other ways of solving the problem, I would hope we're, we're having that, but I'm really nervous about Personally, I'm just really nervous about the impact on a K-8 system. I, oh, I'd like to. Um, I think part of that concern, and I completely understand that, is also understanding the hearts of our principals and the teachers. And nobody wants to have to do those things. I think right. the teacher and principal and the committee would work absolutely tirelessly to figure out what can we do here? Are we able to move this aid at this time in this situation? I don't think we have any principals that are going to say to the families, sorry, you're going to go back to your other schools because we have hired amazing principals. They love the schools. They love the students. Um, these are their communities, their families. Um, they will, and those teachers as well. No teacher is wanting to send a student away. And guaranteed, if that came to be the option, the teacher will say, nope, we will handle it. That, t that student is not going anywhere. Um, I think it's a matter of trusting our our staff, our teachers, and our principals to really do what's best for that school and for those students. And I don't, in my heart, think that would ever happen um, knowing our community 
this this is my community born and raised I will never leave it love my schools um, I in, I work at every single school and I see that community in every single school I know these principals I know those staff they would never let that happen to their school mm -hmm. and if that would be a problem guaranteed they would talk to the principals and the staff and say this is a tough year you guys we're gonna have to just deal with this this way can we play around with our a time what can we do I can take this this time they won't do those things just to stay under a cap size that's not our hearts I think um, with this language we can kind of what if our way yeah. like down a road I think um, that you can see when we first started talking about this because of course workload is an issue post COVID it, it is really challenging to be in education um, you guys know that our admin knows that and because of our unique k-8s we did not adopt class cap language because that is not what we do at Pratham. that's not what we do at butte creek and our teachers know they get together and they decide who's going to teach what grade level how are they going to manage this bubble i think we already have like we is saying that kind of teamwork there and we already took that in stride dialed back that kind of language and just went for supports. So I think what you're saying, I understand what you're saying, but I think you're going to have to trust us to be professionals. So, um, hey, so what I'm understanding, it, it, this really does, we're, we're looking at contracts, we're looking at language, and as opposed to the variables, you, you would like to, to see the language more fixed. Um, to guarantee a process for you to talk, to have that conversation, and I, I'm beginning to understand this much better. I wasn't so sure before, but I'm beginning to hear what you're saying. And uh, sometimes we have to have variables, but what you're, on, what you're telling us as the board and as the community is that there's a gap there that needs to be massaged with language so it doesn't turn into something stressful and adversarial, but can somehow lead to a better resolution when things arise, and I, I understand that. Yeah, I feel like um, we've been able, along with the district, to control the cost concern, mm -hmm. um, the committee concern, the procedural concern, right. and now we really need you to hear us about what starts the process, that aspect of the language. Mm -hmm. So one thing I'm thinking about now is um, the process for negotiating. Um, if there's a change in working conditions, uh, the union can call for an MOU um, to open up and, and talk about those things. If the district has some variable that is troubling, we don't have the same option. Is that correct? Well, it's far more limiting in terms of in terms of uh, our ability to modify the contract. I mean, essentially, we don't have an avenue for modifying the truck co contract based on. <laughs> push factors yeah it depends on the subject area and being able to I mean any any change in working conditions or even a change in the contract would result in a demand to bargain on behalf of the union depending on what subject it is so our options are limited I'm just trying to think of the push here between permanency and fluidity mm -hmm. and right. what avenues both sides already have to control those things right so that's anyway just thinking about that yeah and I actually have a clarifying question along that line as well so in option a b <laughs> two <laughs> um it says that the decision of the advisory committee and i'm assuming am i correct in assuming that this language is as we're looking at here was acceptable to you at work or at least Yes. Yes. Okay. It says the decision of the advisory committee is final and not subject to the grievance procedure. 
And then it goes on to say that once the pool is exhausted, um, no additional appeals will be heard and any classrooms exceeding the published class size will not be subject to a grievance. Right. So are there any circumstances in which it could be grieved? Or is this absolute? I feel like. Well, it's um, difficult to grieve it when it goes to committee. Like basically when it's okay. through committee, that's the end. Okay, so if it was triggered and the response was, man, no, we're not doing that. Yes. That would be yes. a situation in which it would be, okay. It's not if a class goes over a target at all. It's, was the, was the process denied, which it wouldn't be. Okay. Like if there was the, well, the, never mind. If the principal said, no, I don't want to talk about it. Yeah, that's right. a yes, grievable that's situation. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a yeah. process, and yeah, I don't process. think that would even happen. Yeah. <laughs> strikes me too that putting this in as far as cost, we're looking at it from the period perspective of this uh, contract period, but it seems like it'll be an issue that'll be, that'll be in negotiations every three years, how big should the pot be, in the stipend pot, um, and then I guess depending on how the, the class size targets are set, you know, that may also be a subject of negotiations every three years as well. Maybe. Well, I think in bargaining, we've had slippery slope arguments quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and anything that you put in a contract can be negotiated, especially if it's not working or, you know, costs rise. But I don't think that's a good enough reason to, to not address it. But I understand it, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the, in future negotiations, it's going to be real hard to lower or I mean in, increase the, the number um, and so I think that's a f uncontrollable fear right? right and I think it's the same fear on the other side I mean it's 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 we're talking about the same issue I think yeah yeah um, three things um, I guess I, I my concerns about the others have voiced my concerns about how the these lumps of students flow through our k-8s have been expressed well that's my concern my my kids went through Scott's Mills in a large lump like that and the building flexed and adapted and they also you know work um, uh, Two, you know and, and wh where I struggle with and maybe maybe I'm misinterpreting things and you know I'll sleep on it and some back and forth will go but when I hear supports I hear money and and I don't and we're out of money we're out of money it's like we can talk about supports all day long if we're out of money we can't move staff around so I that's kind of a you know Support equals money in my mind and when I hear that and when we're, we don't have a lot That's where I kind of go. What do we do? Um, but third probably the most important thing is I like this what we're doing here tonight yeah. when I hear when I read these things I, I hate lawyers and it's just a <laughs> bunch of lawyered up language and it's good to see faces And actually having a bit of a conversation, you know granted, you know this this stuff will mean more to me Tomorrow when, it, when I look at it again, so thank you Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I would agree with Tom that I wish we had had more of this earlier on. I, I really, ugh, with the special meeting. Um, it's nice that we can talk to you and get questions and perspective. This is wonderful. I, I feel like we just need to push ourselves and be more creative with this language. And um, as a district, as a board, SFEA and see what we can do because I I really I don't sense this is about money anymore it's I even I don't sense that I sense that you're trying to just work a comfortable way to encourage more positive language and discussion to resolve things that's best for the students the classroom and the teachers yeah thank you Last chance before I get to have Yeah, I, I got one more. It's related to some comments a bit ago. There was conversation about working with, you know, your amazing principals. Have you asked those amazing principals what they think about this language? I haven't directly, but from my personal experience with pretty much every single principal in this district, I know that I think sometimes these conversations can be very awkward and that by having language in a contract, it gives them something to fall back to and say, 
all right, here's our process. Instead of just having these <coughs> complaints or very vague, abstract conversations, it gives them a process to kind of say, I hear, <coughs> let's talk about, we have something, let's talk about option A, what can we do? Mm -hmm. It gives them a process to fall back, which is very, I think, a welcoming feeling to principals because it's, then it's just not on their decision or their subjective thinking or it could be viewed as a subjective ruling. Um, I think it's very beneficial for both parties in this instance. And I do, I do want to make one comment that has always been kind of um, heavy on my heart as far as we're not asking for money. However, there is, I understand that yeah. stipend percentage. 1.5% is what we're asking, which really does not add up to a lot. But I think what it also does is help acknowledge when we're not able to do this, we acknowledge the teachers and understanding how much of their own money they are putting in their classrooms. And this provides an additional stipend for them to use towards their classroom, to provide supplies for their students. Those are snacks, those are pencils, those are backpacks, those are feminine products, those are everything yeah. that they yeah. do for the students mm -hmm. that they do out of their pocket. So it acknowledges that because you have 28, 29, 30, 31, 32 kids, you're gonna have to make another run to Costco probably because your snacks are gonna be running. So it does provide that support for the students. They're not pocketing that couple hundred dollars to go to the mall and buy a pair of shoes. That money is going back to the students. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure that that's out there and just known, which I'm sure you guys do, but something that I've always kind of thought of, like this isn't just money for us to be like, yes, shopping spree. It's yeah. going back to the kids. Yeah. And Jonathan, I think that I, one, one key benefit of having something like this in the contract is that it makes it a situation to address with specific helps and less a critique of any person's performance So, not yeah. to heart, but have any of you talked to your principals about it? I'm curious what kind of reactions you've had or conversations there, were they? My dad was on the bargaining team, so <laughs> 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 that would not work. Mm -hmm. We already have an MOU with the class cap at the high school, so it is not an issue. All right, I'm gonna, um, oh, go ahead. So yeah, I just wanna say, uh, again, thanks. Thank the you. additional Thank you dialogue um, give me some additional things to chew on and to think about and consider um, and I hear you so um, just wanted to say again thanks for the time and the comments tonight Thank you for hearing us. Yes. You Thank you. Thank you. Oh, before we go, before we go, I, I just want to comment on um, the I like. I think a contract is a really great thing. I think having clear boundaries is a really very awesome thing. Um, and I also wish that we had a better way to do this dance. <laughs> that because we all, in the end, we're all on the same team, right? Right. Um, and so one of the things that I've observed, and this is just my pontification, but I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say it. Um, we pass the what across the table, mm -hmm. and we say the why sometimes, but it gets lost in the ether sometimes. Like, that perspective of the why is super important, and I feel like it's underemphasized in the bargaining process in general, because um, the what we record, and we did a great job of recording it for our community so people could see, but the why is not there, and I think that that's, the, this perspective piece that I keep saying over and over and over again. So I hope the next time around that we all can come together and maybe agree on some things so that we um, have a smoother road. Um, that would be my, my wish because again, we really are all on the same team. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we are not having back and forth during our public comment time. Um, we may end up not having everybody who wants to speak speak tonight. 
Um, so just be aware. Um, I'm going to try my best, but long meetings don't result in good thinking or decision making. So um, we will now commence with public comment. I'm going to read the statement. We're glad you're here and welcome you to address the board with your ideas, concerns, or compliments. Please keep the following in mind. If you wish to speak, please raise your hand to be recognized by the board chair. If attending remotely, please use the raise hand feature within Zoom. For the record, please provide your name and relationship to the district. Please keep individual remarks to three minutes. If speaking as a representative on behalf of a group of three or more, comment time will be extended to five minutes. A second public comment period will occur later in the meeting that is specific to discussion and action items only. The board will not hear complaints against individual district staff or board members during public comment. Please understand that the board's primary role is to listen and you will likely not receive an immediate response. Finally, remember we all model the way for our students and ask that you share your thoughts respectfully and in accordance with the SFSD board decorum agreement. Would anybody like to approach the table? Go ahead. Hi there, yes. And I'm gonna ask you a few questions first. I see your Skills USA shirt, very yes. nice. Um, what is your name? Uh, my name is Katherine Howe. And what's your relationship to the district? Um, I'm a senior here at Silverton High School. And what are you going to talk about? Um, so I'm here to talk on behalf of the Skills USA competitors who qualified for nationals. So we're going to give you five minutes. Cool. Okay. So hi. Uh, I'm here to ask the district for assistance in talking to local businesses and helping us raise funds so that myself and all of the other competitors who competed this weekend and performed so phenomenally get the chance to show off our skills and by extension the amazingness that the Silverton community has bestowed upon us to the nation. So I went to nationals last year with a group of five of us. This year we had nine teams and students qualify. This increases the number of students we have by an amount, an immense amount. We would really love to show the nation the ability that Silverton High School has provided us through our CTE programs and the skills that we will take on to our future careers through that. We ourselves and our advisors have put in so much work to get us to a state, state championship and a national championship is just so much bigger. And we're aware that for many of us, this is financially not an option. It is, we are flying to, we will be flying to Georgia at the end of the school year. And we all know how plane tickets are right now. Oh, Things yeah. are really expensive. And so we need some help to make that an actual possibility. I know for me, Nationals was invaluable for my photography abilities and my own small business that I have created to benefit members of our community who maybe can't pay a professional photographer the sometimes astonishing rates. And I know a lot of my, student, my fellow students are really excited about the prospect of competing, but we can't do that without any help. And I'd like to ask, would you guys please help us with that? That's cool. So thank you for your time and your ears. I really hope to do our school district proud and maybe win a national championship. Catherine, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. I'm going to refer that one to you guys. Uh, is there anybody online? There's no one online with their hand raised at this time. Anybody else want to speak? Hi there. Hello. Can you explain your name? Uh, my name is Rebecca Pratt. And relationship to the district? 
I teach the self-contained behavior program for third through fifth grade. And uh, the topic that you're gonna speak about tonight? How class sizes affect our special education kiddos. And are you speaking on behalf of a group? Nope, I'm speaking on behalf of okay. just me. We'll have three minutes. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Rebecca Pratt. I am the classroom teacher of the Structured Learning Program or the SLP for the third, fourth, and fifth graders in the district at Butte Creek Elementary. This is my third year teaching this class and my sixth year working in the district. I understand one of the biggest conflicts in our contract right now is class sizes. And I know these large class sizes affect general education students, which is very important. But what I feel has been missing from this conversation is how it also affects our special education students as well. I work with special education students whose behavior impacts their own learning as well as the learning of others. My goal as a teacher is um, my goal as a teacher of this classroom is to help my students learn the skills they need to rejoin their general education classroom, which we call mainstreaming. Um, right now, three of my students are fourth graders. Although this might not seem like a big impact to a class to add only three students, it does become a big impact when there's already 32 students in that fourth grade classroom. Having class sizes this large adds many hurdles for my students when they join in with their general education peers. If all three of my fourth grade students were to join the class at the same time, that would be 35 fourth graders in the same room. My students who are currently learning to manage their big emotions in the SLP with a lot of adult support are more likely to go under the radar of the classroom teacher with, all thir with over 30 students to take care of on top of my kiddos as well. They are likely to struggle to become independent and advocate for themselves, and they may find it difficult to find success in an overwhelming class of this size. This is also true for the kindergarten, first grade, and second grade SLP. They have currently four first graders and would be joining a class of 27 students. That would be 31 first graders in one classroom. I say all of this for one important reason. I tell my students almost every day as their teacher that I have two jobs. My first job is to keep them safe, and I say that one a lot to them. <laughs> my second job is to help them be successful. If I, as their teacher, am not fighting for them to join reasonably sized classes, I don't think I'm doing my best job to help them be successful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just keep an eye out. Okay. I'll let you know. Hi. Hi. What's your name? April Newton. And your relationship to the district? Community member. And your topic? Um, the negotiations. And are you speaking for yourself or just a group? Just for myself. Okay. Three minutes. As a member of city council and a participant in the city budgeting process, I fully understand the cold, hard decisions that must be made due to financial constraints. But from my years spent on the Long Range Facility Committee, I also have a deep understanding of the needs in our district for our school buildings. We have a responsibility to be good stewards for our schools. Passing the upcoming bond is essential to the future of our kids. I believe that manageable class sizes are just as important to our kids. Having class size targets recognized district-wide benefits our kids, our families, and our teachers. Our district leadership has a responsibility to the students and the staff who use our facilities daily this is as important as the responsibility to maintaining the buildings. When we overuse our facilities beyond the capacity they are built for, we are breaking them down faster, creating even more need for repairs and maintenance. I have heard many times over the last year in board meetings about the concern for numbers going down and the students that did not come back after COVID and the need to keep our enrollment numbers up. I'm concerned that class size will drive more students away from our district. I'm concerned that we continue to drive excellent teachers out of our district. I'm very concerned that the public will not support the bond if the district cannot settle with the teachers and prevent a strike from happening. I truly believe if there is a strike, we're lowering our chances of passing this bond. And I know that you all agree how badly we need this bond. A board's job is not to just back up your administration. A board's job is to represent your public, to do what is best for the kids of our community. We all know that class size matters. We all know a child in a smaller class is in a better learning environment. We all know that retaining our quality teachers matters. The public wants an administration and a board that supports teachers, acknowledges the importance of class size, and works for us, the public. Silverton is a caring community. We are capable of being good stewards for our most important resource, our kids. 
In order to do that, we need to take care of our facilities and our school employees, both of which are limited resources. As a community member, I will continue to support and stand with our teachers, and I hope that after listening tonight that you will all do that too. state your name. Hi, I'm Laura Beville. I am the chair of the after school activities program. Okay, cool. and your topic tonight? Um, my topic is a potential strike. And <laughs> are you speaking for yourself or a group? I am speaking for after school activities program board. Okay, so five minutes. <clears throat> I'm not going to need that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my name is Laura Beville, and um, my children have been in this school district since 2018, and I am sort of speaking on two hats. Uh, one is as a mom, but also as uh, the After School Activities Board Chair, Program Board Chair. Um, for those of you who don't know what After School Activities Program is, it's a free program that our community provides with all community support and fundraising. Uh, for middle schoolers. We partner with the middle school. We partner um, in amazing ways to support kids through academic coaching, learning, mentoring, um, all kinds of really amazing things. We have partners um, that have come and visited our program with uh, dentists and uh, doctors and um, we had some farm equipment come <laughs> a couple months ago that was super exciting for the students. Students are uh, learning how to cook chicken noodle soup and lasagna in the Emmanuel Church kitchen um, and all kinds of wonderful programming that happens for our middle schoolers. Um, I have a middle schooler <laughs> and she receives special services and we have greatly seen her uh, benefit from small class sizes and in that environment. And my son, who is now a third grader, was a COVID kindergartner, I've observed him struggling with academics and most especially social skills. Our students in ASAP are struggling. Um, they're struggling in all of the unrest that is in our community and in the world. And we have noticed, um, like most things post-COVID, that folks are tentative to access resources that are available in the community, even free uh, resources like ASAP. And yet services that support youth in our community are desperately needed more than ever, as you all know. ASAP follows the Silver Falls School District schedule, and when the district makes difficult decisions to close due to weather, or as we did several years ago for COVID, we follow suit as a program, just as general protocol. Um, should the teachers go on strike, it will affect our programming dramatically for ASAP. And we have struggled post-COVID um, to be able to provide staffing and to be able to provide uh, enough students to be able to continue the program. We rely on bus service from the middle school for our program. And so please, we implore your teams to reach an agreement so that our students can see how disagreements can be worked out with fair compromise. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else from the audience like to approach? Hi there. Can you state your name and relationship to the district? Shannon Montoya. I'm a, a taxpayer, grandmother of four kids in the district, mother of three elementary teachers, one in this district. And what's and your topic so tonight? I, I just want to talk a little bit about the classroom size. We're going to give you three minutes. Got it. Okay. Got it. Ready, go. So um, I also spent 33 years, I think, working for Freightliner, which is a large um, uh, truck manufacturer. 
was a manager for most of that time. And honestly, I've found the discussion today um, kind of interesting. I've always tried to take the, the private sector and say, why does it need to be different in the public sector? But what I have found, and I think uh, it was drilled into me at my employer, is the only way to have a sustainable process and one that uh, works for all schools, regardless if they have different sizes and different makeups, you can still have the same process. But the only way it's sustainable is to have it documented. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up when it was kind of, I think I heard wink and a nod to say, trust me. And that worked in the old days, but I think people now expect and deserve the transparency for why we make these decisions. And I think it just makes sense that if you want it sustainable, that it needs to be documented. I strongly encourage the district to find a way. You know, that's, that's all I want to say. It seems like it's such, I think everybody's well-intentioned, but saying it's fearful, transparency should never be feared. You know, I mean, that's just, it's all. You can't understand what you cannot see. So anyway, my two cents. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Anybody else? Hi. Hi. What's your name? Laura Morris. And what's your relationship to the district? Um, I am married to a teacher in the district, and my stepdaughter goes here. Okay, and the topic you want to speak about today? Um, the amount of love that I see from the teachers. Okay, and um, are you speaking for yourself? Yes. Okay, three minutes. <laughs> All right. So, um, my, my wife comes home every night and tells me about her journey with her kids. And I can see so much love on her face for them. She gets sad when they're sick. She gets sad when they leave. She gets excited about their growth. And I imagine that all the teachers are like this with their students. And wanting to be able to give them the individual attention that they need is important to them. My stepdaughter, it's important that she gets the attention that she needs to be able to learn and to do these things. As a kid going to school in sometimes a small school, we had like 16 kids in our class. Sometimes it was a lot, but after a while our class grew and I noticed a difference. I had a harder time learning as well. I was overlooked. Um, I was just lucky I had parents who were really helpful. I wish and hope that these kids with the great deal of love that they have from their teachers and the support that, that is already in their classrooms, they get the help that they deserve, that they need to be successful. And I hope that these teachers are able to make ends meet. We're already struggling on trying to keep an apartment, let alone teachers having four kids in, in a big old house to, to manage. Just, I, I, I commend them for wanting to go back to school every single day to help them and to love them and to show them that it might be the only spot that they feel love. And if they're spread so thin that they're not able to give that love enough, they're not gonna get love at school either. That was the place I felt love. Though my parents helped me with, with homework, it didn't necessarily mean that I felt loved. I liked school because that is where I felt loved. So I'm hoping that this can be a safe place for the children as well. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take one more public comment. Somebody want to come up? Anybody online? Nobody online. All right. Um, there will be a second public comment period later in the agenda. 
We're going to go to administrator and staff reports. Uh, Superintendent Scott Drew. Thank you, Jennifer. Board, uh, we're going to go ahead and walk you through the district's latest proposal on class size. A good portion of this is, has been discussed and everybody has copies of these uh, proposals were spread throughout um, <clears throat> the library. And so this is just a summary of the, the district's last proposal. I know a lot of people have seen this through the emails and everything, so this is, is not new, but this is our first board meeting since our last mediation session. And so uh, we did present two options to SFEA and they are they, they're different in terms of trying to be responsive to things that we've heard and again the first one provides a, a annual establishment of, of ratios or targets uh, for k5 and k8 which will be on the next slide um, we did set aside the pool of money for stipends when those ratios or targets couldn't uh, be were, or were exceeded um, and that the teacher may seek the stipend um, if this class size supports are in, insufficient or unavailable and so um, and you know like you heard tonight I think the committee approach I appreciate Janet uh, coming up with a, a good chunk of this ideas that I think that I think we've resolved as you heard tonight from SFBA we've resolved a lot of the conflict issues around resolution so um, as you heard I think we're we've we've tackled a lot of the issues um, and so and just so you know that this process does allow for case load uh, even though our our ratios or targets do not specifically identify case load limits the way there there's a portion of the contract or the the proposal that would allow them to go through the same process and so those are what we would have as our uh, proposed targets for 23 24 um, and and that's essentially what we've tried to budget for. It's usually what we, uh, and that's really probably how that process would be established annually is uh, where do we see our ability to fund for teachers FTE into uh, our classrooms. And so these would be our proposed targets that would be referenced in the contract language. So again, uh, when we talk about triggers, I mean, there's, a, there's still an, a process annually by which the district's obligated, because if the district doesn't provide those targets, um, that would be violating the contract. And so there'd be an obligation for the district to publish those targets annually, which would then go through those other processes that are outlined in the contract. And then option B um, is more of the class size, class makeup, and or, or case load concerns um, and I do really appreciate what was uh, some of the the comments that the SFEA made tonight in terms of how we talk about kids for sure I don't think we want to set a no one's no one's wanting to set up something that would change the way we we do talk about kids but we are funded um, where some kids get more and and we also oftentimes have needs and so we thought that this was uh, an opportunity to uh, not have a static number keep somebody from saying I need some more assistance and I do trust that how we talk about kids um, can still be positive and proactive um, in terms of trying to provide teachers support um, if they have a classroom that needs where they're saying I need some more assistance or um, and if that assistance like Tom was talking about is we're out then they could go through the same process for for a stipend so the pathway after um, on those, and they're highlighted in the handouts there, um, you know, once, once you get past the highlights, the path, the path is the same. And so um, one of the things that we would like to do, because I think a lot of this through this process has been, what are our class sizes? I think there's been a lot of questions around, around that. And so this is just a screenshot, but this is a dashboard that we're gonna release this week that will have uh, class sizes on it. So there's, if you, well, I'll say in instructions in my everyone email that will, this will go out to, but there's a drop down there where you can go and you can click on which school and it'll show you 
what your class sizes are at. And if this was a bigger screenshot, the, the middle school and high school would be down below and you could actually look at what every teacher has uh, because SFBA's proposal does have secondary classrooms included on that. So you can go through there and you can kind of, you'll be able to see um, what our current class sizes are per teacher. I think that's about it. Did I, anything I missed, team? So the dashboard is going to be available um, not just for employees, but everybody. Yeah, it'll be available to the public, yeah. Any questions, board members? I just had one. Um, so, Dan, is it my understanding, is the process still, um, I heard earlier about a grievance process or a complaint process. I mean, is that, would that still remain in place unless otherwise changed? Well, I don't, I mean, I'm not sure quite what Allison meant by that. I mean, the, anybody has the opportunity to, to make a complaint or go through a process. And I think that anytime there's, you know, our grievance process allows to, if, the, if someone believes the contract has been, hasn't been followed, there's the mm -hmm. opportunity to, to file a grievance. So I think that, you know, one of our concerns in this, as we've worked through this article, has been, you know, grieving class size when we don't have a lot of control over that. And, I think our last proposal has remedied some of that, some of our concerns. SFBA is at least based on their response to the committee process. Um, I think has alleviated some of our concerns around grievability. Hey Dan, um, I, I got a question. Is there any way, I mean, I, I, I assume there's not, but this doesn't show additional supports. It doesn't show aids or, you know, so you, you may have a higher class size, but you don't know if there's an aid in that classroom or not. Correct. You this would is not. just the gross classroom number. Correct. Period. This is just Correct. Homeroom, kids, that's it. Yep. Okay. I've got a, qu <clears throat> a question. Can you just summarize the fundamental? I mean, it sounds like the big distinction is whether the addended targets is in the contract or whether it's established annually is can you describe from your perspective why that difference is relevant to you? So why having these numbers in the contract? Um, I think, you know, to the points that were made earlier during your discussion is that having these static numbers, you know, per, you know there's, there's an if-then relationship here. And, and, and right now we've tried to, we've come a long ways on the then side of the, the, this conversation about what happens then. And I think that um, the if side of it is a really concern for the district in terms of having something that, that we don't have full control over to be able to, um, to have it in contract language. Because once it's in there, um, then it's an agreement. It's an agreement that we both um, live with. And so I think that that is our biggest concern is having a static number in there that isn't that we cannot change, we would not change because it's a it's an agreement that we we reach. So, I, I mean, largely these numbers are very close um, to SFEA's proposal. So I don't think there's I think there might be some slight changes by one two students at the most. Um, so it's not like we disagree with where the numbers are at. We disagree with keeping them in there for three years at a time. Can these, I guess when I'm, we're talking about the numbers and they were talking about not caps but targets, is that something that can be visited each year to potentially look at the targets and um, somehow creatively work that into something that um, the district feels comfortable with along? Well, our proposal says that we would do this annually. And okay. that we would establish these targets <clears throat> annually to say this is this is the number by which if it if a class a teacher's classroom exceeds this number, okay. then that process would go. Um, okay. And the the fundamental difference is is these numbers being published annually by the district right. versus being 
part of a, a collective bargaining agreement in statically in the contract. So I've got a question. I meant to ask this of SFBA, but I can ask it here of you. But I'm not going to speak for SFBA. No, no. Okay. Speak, speak <laughs> Just making sure that's clear. Will this class size, if, if it would be acceptable, will this class size uh, provision materially change class sizes in the district? I would not think so. Okay. My opinion would be that it would not lower class size. And the annual, the proposed annual setting of the targets is responsive to budgeting needs and other factors, um, personnel, <coughs> space considerations, um, who lives where, uh, are there other things that would be considered? I, mean, I think the budgetary one's just always the biggest one. Thank you. Other questions? Go ahead. After tonight, after we heard about language just being introduced to ease conversation between the teachers <coughs> and principal, I got to be careful, I guess, how I ask this. We're Is not bargaining. Yeah. Yeah. I can't ask it any further. Well, I, yeah, I just think, well, let's be careful. Would the, oh, I guess I can't, because here's my question. Would the district be amenable to consider that or is that too much did i ask too much maybe i meant okay i think dan answered it earlier <laughs> dan answered it earlier when he said he's listening to everything okay so <laughs> any other questions all right all right is there anything else you're presenting on no okay uh moving on 11A. Uh, this is a discussion item. We have three candidates for the budget committee positions. We have four positions, three candidates. Uh, we are not going to decide tonight because uh, we did not have the applications in enough time to consider. We will uh, move that discussion to, uh, or the decision making to the uh, work session, the next okay. work session. Okay. We, the policy is there. I hope everybody looks at the policy. If we want to have a discussion about that, we can. I don't think it's very fruitful personally, but we, oh. <laughs> we can. I'm good without having a conversation. Yeah. Do, right. Are we rattling the, the bush? I mean, well, have you one more? <laughs> Send out more. Oh. Okay. Yeah. But we can operate without a full slate. It's not like we can't move forward without a full slate. But, so we will deal with those three applicants at the okay. next meeting. Okay. All right, moving on. Draft 23-24 school year calendar. And Mr. Palmer, are you gonna present to us? Yes. Okay, um, same with this topic. Uh, we are giving this, we're discussing this tonight. We are not gonna decide tonight. We wanna make sure that the public has enough um, time to give us, uh, send us an email, um, but we will not uh, be holding it over to the next regular meeting. It's important for us to get it taken care of at the work session. So this is an, another unusual scheduling thing. Do you guys have hard copies? No. With you, you no. all? Yes. That'd be great. <laughs> maybe so. So, so present yeah, we're not gonna decide. Okay. Thank you again. Okay. <laughs> while, uh, while the copies are making their way down, I want to take a second to recognize our calendar committee folks. Uh, Elena Mandish, Chris Freeman, Lisa Roth, Tammy Dieter, and Andrea Nelson. So they put a lot of work in, not only coming up with some ideas,
putting some thought into these, but getting them around to the buildings so that staff can have a chance for input. I'll make a couple of comments just in, in general uh, that are really pertinent to both drafts of this calendar. Um, you'll see the weekly early release dates, uh, except for the first week and the last week of school. Um, everything that is, uh, every early release date that's colored or highlighted green, those are proposed as um, school-based PLC work versus district-wide. Um, you'll also notice that October 13th, the statewide in-service day is back in the calendar. Uh, proposal for, for this next year, it was taken out this year um, as a way to end the school year in a timely fashion because of the Juneteenth holiday. So it's back in and um, thank you for accepting our revised draft too. Uh, that was a little bit different than the one that was sent you originally and it was just a simple um, error that, we, that I did not uh, catch that our grading periods were imbalanced in the second semester. So we just had moved some, some uh, end of the grade period dates around and uh, You'll see then down below that, that um, each of the grading periods in the second semester is actually equally balanced at 28 days each. And so that works out, uh, just caused a few dates to slide around in March, April, and May, just a little bit, but not really anything of substance um, caused by that. So let's look at draft one just quickly. This is what you might call our typical calendar. Um, Typical winter break, that's really the biggest, I think, change between the two calendar drafts. Uh, typical grade periods, typical end of the semester dates, um, end of January for that. And this one has the teacher's last work day on uh, Monday, June 17th. So uh, the last day of school being Friday the 14th. It's the only way to get 173 days to keep our calendar with the number of student contact days that we have right now. We don't want to reduce those at all. Um, draft two was uh, suggested in, in the committee uh, in our first meeting and it starts uh, the winter break later. We go to school through uh, Friday, December 22nd, and we come back as teacher work day on Monday, January 8th. So uh, that's a, a change uh, in, in our typical way of doing things. And then the student's first day back is Tuesday, January 9th. Mm -hmm. And the reason this is suggested as an option is because it encompasses the Russian Christmas. Nice. Russian Christmas uh, is a two-day holiday. Christmas Day is the seventh, but um, our, our, our staff members uh, from the, the Old Believer community have confirmed with me that the students would most certainly be out of school on Monday the 8th as well. And uh, this takes care of that. Mm -hmm. This allows all students to come back on Tuesday the 9th without having our Russian kids miss a day. Now, this type of thing year in and year out, if you look at where January 7th and 8th fall in the next few years past 2024, um, it's not necessarily something that we can always mm -hmm. address, but then it's gonna come back around, you know, as, as calendar dates do at some point, and it might be again down the road, uh, but it is for next year. And so it's, it's interesting. Um, the, uh, like I said, our committee did a great job of getting these around and reporting back uh, to where, what, what each school feels would be their preference. And it was six to five uh, throughout the schools. Uh, five schools preferred with the typical, you know, uh, draft one and six schools preferred draft two. So as even as you can get yeah. with 11 schools um, responding. So there you have the two options. 
food for thought. Um, do you have any questions for me? <laughs> Which one? <laughs> well, personally, and uh, I will speak for the ones on our calendar committee that, that took a stand today, and because I asked them, each person that, and three of us, um, the only three that answered said number two, because if we can, if we can prevent a, a loss of school day for a Russian uh, community, let's do it. You know, and there were lots of ideas that came out. You know, hey, this doesn't give us a lot of time to prepare for Christmas, you know, because we're going to, to school through the 22nd. But it gives you a lot of time on the back end of that holiday to oh, just nice. rest. You know, we made it past Christmas, we made it past New Year's, and a full week after that, just to come down off after it made some sense to people as well. So... I'm in favor of number two. The other two committee members that responded were also in favor of number two. If we can do it, let's do it. But well, and you know, like two, two. we can get um, public input to via email. Yes. Uh, we will not have another meeting yeah. where people can give public comment, but they can always email us about this. That's nice. Others yeah. want to make any comments? Yeah. I, I was looking through this before the meeting, and, and I looked at it, and albeit that you know, option two does start the break later. Kevin, to your point, I, I like the fact that it encompasses kind of both holidays and you get that kind of rest on the back end and the kids will be ready to come back maybe after that. But the one piece that I really thought was much cleaner was ending the school year for our teachers on the 14th mm -hmm. and not bringing them back on the 17th. Yeah. I just, mm -hmm. I think it'd be best to just be able to button it up that week and then not have to have a weekend to come back. Thank you for mentioning that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. it just, it doesn't, it, it because doesn't. you're correct, that is another byproduct of draft yeah. two is that we are done on Friday the 14th. It, it makes yeah, more sense nice. to me, but I, I also like the fact that you brought up that we're being, you know, culturally responsible or res responsive to, to, you know, many of our Russian believers in our community. Yeah. Um, and it just makes it, it, it just made it better for all of our, our community members and, again, our educators, too. So Yeah, we don't always have the opportunity yeah. to do that. And this time we do. Um, I mean, I would love to have our spring break fall on the Russian Easter week every year, yeah. but that's not yeah. that would help. That's yeah. not going to happen. Yeah. Um, I like to I like the the, the block of days on, on option two, the block of days before Christmas, between Christmas and Thanksgiving. Yeah. You got yeah. a large one, two. You got three, mm -hmm. three full four four full weeks uh -huh. of education, mm -hmm. so it's a chunk. It, it is an it is a sometimes that break that time uh, between Christmas. Yeah. Thanksgiving and Christmas is short. Yeah. That's a very good point, Tom. It is a great point. You know, mm -hmm. you're doing Christmas program practices and you're doing other things. This is that's a really good point. I hadn't thought about that. You know, the last day of school is on Flag Day, and I always feel like it feels celebratory because <laughs> you see all the flags on. So I don't know. It's that little extra right. that's just kind of a yeah. little visual pump. But anyway, Love but it. yeah, I like two quite a bit. Any comments? Uh, Mr. Palmer, thank you for your your dedication <laughs> yeah. to this year in and year out. Yeah. Thank, yeah. You. Yeah. Thank, thank you. You're welcome, guys. Yeah. Thanks. Yes, thank you to the committee. Yeah, All right. Uh, the second public comment period is coming up. It's specific to discussion and action items. If you'd like to speak during the public comment and are attending virtually, use the raise hand feature on Zoom. If you're attending in person, please approach the public comment table located in front of the board. Quick question, Jennifer. Are we not having the uh, financial report tonight? Oh, yes, sorry. No financial report. Okay. Uh, Steve is gone. I noticed that, <laughs> yeah. but you hadn't mentioned it. So I yeah. meant to. Double check. It goes in and out. Anybody want to speak? Eliza? Liza, would you um, uh, explain your name in relationship to the district to us? Say your name. Yeah. My name is Eliza Torlin, and I am a parent in the district and an active community member. And what topic do you want to speak on tonight? I wanted to talk about uh, your bargaining communication tonight. Okay. And um, is it just 
you? It's just me. Okay, three yeah. minutes. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for offering this opportunity for public dialogue with the SFEA bargaining team. I hope that tonight's discussion has brought this contract closer to completion. I believe we can trust our teachers to work around nearly every obstacle placed in their path. Before tonight, I couldn't understand the sticking points. After tonight's conversation, I hear that this bargaining team is working to protect their members who may lack confidence to advocate for themselves. Tonight has offered a new way forward toward building trust. Thank you so much for making this discussion public and uh, offering a back and forth. Thank you guys, too, for doing that. Um, our community needs rich dialogue like this to show how much we all care about supporting our students. We are all facing the same problem, limited funding. As grown-ups, we must avoid conflict that limits kids' access to school. I really hope we don't move to a strike. I wonder if there could be language in the contract about having administration and SFEA teams meet annually to set numbers for class size targets. That would be my advice. Thank you. Oh, very nice. Thank you. Nobody said Eliza couldn't bargain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. Anybody online? Nobody online. Okay. Anybody else like to approach the so table? Like you could just come forward. You don't have to wait for me to see your hand. Hello. Hi. Would you please state your name and relationship to the district? Carissa Dow, and I have a sixth grader at the middle school. And what's your topic? Class sizes and the um, calendar that was just discussed. Okay, so three minutes. Okay. I just want to um, say that my daughter's math class, she's in advanced math in sixth grade. And if every student shows up to that class, there's not enough seats. So if we're taking class sizes as averages across the district where we have some schools that have 30 kids, whereas her math class has 35 kids. Um, I think that's definitely something that needs to be taken into account because my daughter doesn't have a desk to do her math at. Class size is too big and needs to be evaluated. Um, as far as the calendar, we, just, er, we heard that we are taking into account the Russian Christmas celebrations. And then also there was a little bit of a joke made about <laughs> taking Easter week off for spring break. We have students in our district that are not Christian. I am not Christian. I don't identify as. And we have Jewish students that, teach, uh, that celebrate Passover. They celebrate Hanukkah. Uh, if we are going to take into consideration other religious holidays for our scheduling, we need to consider all religions. We have students that celebrate Ramadan. Mm -hmm. And if we are going to, again, consider religions, other religions, celebrations, um, it needs to be considered for all religions, otherwise it's not appropriate. Um, and it was really disappointing <laughs> to hear so much congratulations among this room for that because we are expressly excluding students that do not celebrate and do not identify with those religions in our district by doing this. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to approach the table? I see one person coming. Hi Good evening, there. Sarah Weitzman. Uh, parents, um, uh, superintendent report, bargaining, whatever, all the, all the, all the good stuff tonight. Um, so, um, three myself, minutes. three minutes. Um, I wanted to say thank you, uh, like Eliza said, I think it was really, really, really important to allow the union to come speak with you tonight and get to hear their perspective. Um, and one thing that I wanted to say as a parent is that class size is extremely important to me. And when I looked at the language in the proposal from SFEA, um, it strikes me interesting to think that it's not odd for a three-year contract to put in your salaries for three years 
your benefits for three years. There's certain things that are definitely concrete in a contract for three years. What is wrong with putting a class size of 23 for elementary kids for three years? Nothing. Because why would we want to, in, in three years, we're not going to be like, well, let's change it to 40 or something like that. So um, I'm just kind of struggling to see what the resistance is for when you're, you have a contract for three years. So, and I understand that there's budgetary concerns, and that's where I would like the district to focus on. Let's cut the fat in some places. Let's quit bringing Starbucks to listening meetings. So look harder at your, at your budget to figure out how you can accommodate those types of things. So um, I just wanted to give you a little food for thought and just to thank you again for letting the union have that dialogue because I think it was really important and I think it made things much more clear for lots of people, including the public. So thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, I think we're gonna move on then. Uh, future agenda item request. Any requests out there? All right, uh, we are next going to move into executive session, so the room needs to clear. We will be back if you wanna come back, but it's probably not exciting. I will. Yep. We're going to now move into executive session under ORS 192.6602F to consider information or records that are exempt by law from public inspection. Sick leave bank request. All right, we're moving back into open session to consider a sick leave bank request. Is there a motion? Yeah, uh, I move that we establish up to 10 days of sick leave bank for Emma Milstead. Second. It's been moved and seconded to establish a sick leave bank request for up to 10 days for Emma Milstead. Um, I don't think we'll have discussion, so let's go ahead and vote. Tom? Aye. Jonathan? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Owen? Yes. Lori? Yes. Janet? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Thank you. All in favor? All right. Um, that is the last item. So without objection, meeting adjourned. Good.